What a powerful song. I know that's the prayer of our hearts this morning that not just on Sabbath and worship when the music is good, but all week long, every day, even on Tuesday morning, that the Lord would order our steps in his word. Praise God for the ministry of music this morning. What a blessing it has been. To get right to the word, we've had a full service this morning, and so we're we're starting the message a bit late, but the Lord has something for us, and so we don't want to shortchange the word, but at the same time, I'm not going to be long this morning. Amen? Amen. Somebody doesn't believe me. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father, we ask today that you would order our steps in your word. Lord, come now by your spirit and reveal to us, Lord, what is at the core of our difficulty, Father, to follow you and to do what you say. And then show us, Lord, how it is that you're seeking to fix that very thing. Lord, show us that in Jesus already we have a solution. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shahoya Yokowai spent 28 years of his life in prison. But it was not a prison of prison bars and locks and wardens, but actually it was a prison of fear of his own making. He was a soldier in the Japanese army during World War II. And he was on the island of Guam when the Americans came on ground. He was so afraid at that time that he ran off and he hid in a cave. And there he sustained himself while the war was going on. But even after pamphlets fell from the sky to say that the war was over, he didn't believe it, he was still afraid, and so he kept on hiding out in a cave. He would only come out at nighttime in order to get together roaches and rats and <laughs> frogs and mangoes, which he lived on. It was only after many years that finally, after these 28 years, some of the natives were able to convince him that the war really was over and he could now finally come out of his hiding place. And when we hear it, immediately we start to think to ourselves, what a waste <laughs> being shut away and locked in by fear for all those years. But the truth is that if we were to take a moment to think about it, we realize that many of us are just as captive, just as imprisoned to fear. Even some of us here today. So I want to start this, this afternoon by asking you the question, what are you afraid of? Or what is your greatest fear? As soon as we ask or hear these questions, we're likely to reveal some fear that is focused on some outward object or situation, like a fear of snakes, a fear of heights, a fear of large crowds or, or, or spiders or something like that. I don't know if I've called yours, but I definitely called mine a fear of snakes. <laughs> But the reason for this is because it's much easier for us to spot fear that is external. Fear that's fixed on something outward. But contrawise, it is just as difficult to spot fear that is internal. Such as a fear of failure, a fear of rejection, a fear of being alone a fear of being left alone. These inward fears often 
are unconscious and therefore they go by largely unnoticed. So if we're not able to claim some outward obvious fear, such as a fear of something terrible happening to a loved one or fear of small spaces, then usually we conclude that we're not controlled by fear. Some are, but I'm not. This means that most of us are in bondage to fear and we don't even know it. Even more unfortunate than this is the fact that what that means is that for many of us, our lives are controlled by fear. Our actions are motivated by fear. And we're not even aware of it. Today, we're going to explore some of the dynamics of fear. We're going to identify what is the greatest fear that is common to all of us. And also, we're going to identify the greatest antidote to fear that the universe has ever known in the message entitled, Perfect Love. I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John 4, verse 18. And then I'm going to invite you to keep your Bibles open as we're going to be referring back to the text. 1 John 4, 18. So there's a page that will give you a chance to find it. First John 4 and verse 18. This morning I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. As a wrinkled gray old man, the Apostle John sits down to write a letter from Ephesus to a new generation of Christians. They have heard of Jesus, excuse me, and have believed in him, but they've never had the opportunity to physically see him for themselves. Here's the message of John. God has sent his son, Jesus in the flesh, and other eyewitnesses, as well as John, have been able to proclaim this Jesus, this living Lord, to the world. And as many people have, who have been willing to hear and confess faith in Jesus, they have now been able to be united through the Spirit to the Father and the Son. Now they have a rich, deep, intimate fellowship, koinonia, with the Father, the Son, and all other believers everywhere who calls and believes in the name of Jesus. But as John writes, he wants true believers to be able to know the difference between calling yourself a Christian and actually being one. Between claiming this fellowship and actually being an authentic part of this divine inner circle. Here's the great litmus test that forms a clear boundary of distinction between those who are in and those who are just faking it. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. This critical, crucial truth about God forms clear and separate categories between sin and obedience, light and darkness, truth and deception, love of the Father and love of the world, and in this case, between fear and perfect love. We would expect for love to be distinguished from what? From hate. But John shows us with psychological insight that is 2,000 plus years ahead of 
its time that the primary thing that opposes love is not hate, but fear. Could it be that our hostility, our prejudice, our sometimes cruelty and meanness is a result of us just being scared? One sociologist seeks to address this. She says, why are people mean? <laughs> Here's the short answer. They're hurt. Here's the long answer. They're really hurt. <laughs> At some point, somebody did them dirty. They were crushed, and they're still afraid the pain will never stop or that it will happen again. She goes on to say, the typical storyline of a mean person goes like this. I am a victim. People want to hurt me. I must hurt them first and be safe. Just think about that the next time somebody's mean to us or the next time we're tempted to be mean ourselves. Of course, we know that this is only one reaction that people have to the fact that we live in a dangerous world. Some people respond to fear by excessive niceness. Mm -hmm. They're very accommodating. Mm -hmm. They're willing to please any and everybody. Some people respond to fear in debilitating withdrawal, but the point is that all of us find some way to defend ourselves as a response to fear. And the outcome of such defensiveness is never love. Always self-preoccupation. But never love. Fear and love do not go together. Where there is the presence of fear, there cannot be perfect love. That's what John is trying to say. This is not only true of our relationship with each other, but this is also true of our relationship with God. It's especially true of our relationship with God. John reveals to us also in this text that our greatest fear, you want to know what our greatest fear is? Our greatest fear, the one that drives every other fear, is our fear of God and the judgment we know we deserve. That's the fear that makes us fundamentally afraid and drives every other fear. Deep within us, there's this uncanny ability to know that the end of natural human existence is judgment and punishment. At the core of our being, from the time that we are able to know the difference between right and wrong, there is this dreadful expectation of judgment. I remember feeling it as a child. You just know this is not going to end well. This is the center of our existence as fallen men and women in this fallen world. Even the person who claims that they don't even believe in the existence of God is still, if they would admit it, deep down afraid. Afraid of the judgment that they sense will one day come. And by the way, that's why many people deny the existence of God. Because they hope that they never have to face it. But this is a fundamental human condition. Alienation from God, distance, separation from God, based on fear. Do you hear me today? And when this destructive fear is at the center of our psyche, at the center of our perspective, it causes us to always be on the defensive. Life becomes about self-preservation. And this self-preservation causes us to be at odds with God, with others, and even ourselves. We see it right away, don't we, with Adam and Eve. <laughs> as soon as sin enters, perfect love 
is replaced by destructive fear. Before, they're naked and unashamed. But now, they're trying to hide behind anything that they can find. Before, she's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But now, she's just an expendable other. He hopes that God will zap her and save him. And all of this because sin has caused the approach of God to become a very terrifying experience. Fear has replaced perfect love. And now we can see that there's something even more sinister lying under and behind fear. Guilt. The knowledge that we have done wrong. Guilt causes fear, and fear causes defensiveness and control. And that's the reason why some of us are not even able to tell that we're afraid. Because we've sought to do such a masterful job of keeping things under control so we never have to face our fears. We don't know we're afraid because we're, we're in such a, a rhythm of keeping ourselves well guarded so we never have to be afraid. That's what our defensiveness and excessive niceness and meanness and even much of our vigilance and dutifulness is really all about. Methods of control that are meant to keep us from our fears. Not to mention our compulsive behaviors and our destructive addictions. We scared, y'all. <laughs> These controls keep us from our fear of being hurt, abused, rejected, abandoned, misunderstood. And the list goes on and on. So now, let me ask you again. What are you afraid of? Even though we have come to Christ, we're still recovering from this basic center of fear that makes us self-centered and self-preoccupied. We're recovering from trauma. And if we're going to be fully and eternally a part of this new community of fellowship with the Father and the Son and true believers, then God has to do something about this fear. God has to find some way to free us from our fear. Do you hear what I'm saying today? I'm saying that we think that we need to fix the things on the outside. I need to be nicer. I need to, you know, do more. I need to be more loving. I need to stop doing this, start doing that. But you can't fix the things on the outside without realizing that the problem lies deep on the inside. The problem is a fundamental fear that causes our cycles and patterns of behavior. You can't deal with this on the outside before you deal with the issue of deep-seated fear on the inside. And I know this is one of those sermons where it takes a while for what's really being said to sink in. It's going to be Wednesday before we say it. No, really. Because we're going to start seeing in our lives. This is why I do that. And that's one of the things that God has to do before he can start healing us and freeing us. He has to start showing us what really lies at the root of our issues. He has to show you why you're being so mean. That's why I'm so impatient. You start to trace it. 
Then you can come to him and then he can start to heal it. God has to do something about this fear. We have no hope unless he is able to free us from this fundamental human fear that affects us all. We don't even want to be friendly sometimes because <laughs> we're too worried about how we look, how our hair is, what the person's going to think about me. Fear holds us back. What will God do? Praise be to his name. In this very same text, we get the answer. We see what God does. God does something for believers. He uses his perfect love to cast out fear. God acts inwardly to deal with our fear. That word, cast out, in the original language means to cause a state to cease by force. <laughs> with the implication of elimination, to remove, to drive out, to do away with. Perfect love becomes that great big bouncer who walks over the fear and grabs him by the scruff of the neck and takes him and pushes him off the premises. He says, fear, I don't know where you're going, but you can't stay here. Perfect love does that. But what fills me with such awe and sense of beauty is when I'm able to see how God goes about perfecting his perfect love in us. How does he do it? We see it a little earlier, starting with verse 13 of chapter 4. Chapter 13. Chapter 4, verse 13 now. Hereby, we that we know, hereby know we, rather, that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit, and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Amen. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him. And he in God. Now he's talking about the fact that God dwells in us by the Holy Spirit because we've confessed Jesus. And he says, and we have known and believed. Other versions say, we have come to know and believe the love that God has to us. The love that God has for us. Do you see what this is saying? This is saying that we've come to know and believe that it's true. This love that God has for us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. This is how our love is made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. This is how God does it. He sends perfect love in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, into a dark, fearful, unloving, and imperfect world. And everyone who sees this Jesus and says, he's going to be my Savior, whoever believes in him and confesses his name, then he sends perfect love in the form of the Holy Spirit into a dark, unloving, imperfect heart. Verse 16 says, this is how we have come to know and believe the love God has for us. So first of all, we have come to know, we've come to believe because of what God did in the first place. He initiated. He came to live in us. He sent his son so that we could have the opportunity to be joined to perfect love. He acted. This is how we've come to know. But more is going on here. Both of these words, come to know and believe, are, are written in the special Greek tense. That means action that happened in the past with continuing results in the presence. Wow. In, other, present, in other words, we have at some point in the past 
come to know God's love and have come to believe or rely on God's love. But it has continuing results. Amen. So still now, we're experiencing this truth. Every day we come to deeper and deeper realizations of what it means for him to have sent his son, what it means for him to have given us his spirit. Amen. Every day we say, he loves me. Amen. Then we go a little further. He loves me. Amen. Then we go a little further. Oh my goodness. Amen. He loves me. Yes. And I know, I know, I know that I didn't deserve for him to send his son in the first place. Yes. There was nothing I ever could have done to deserve it. I know that I know that I don't deserve for his spirit to dwell in me. Me? No, not me. I know it. And I knew. I just knew that at some point he was going to leave me. I knew it. I knew because I keep messing up. I knew because I, it's just taking me so long to get it. I knew because, because even though he keeps giving me his love, I keep resisting it over and over. I just knew that one day the spirit was going to get up and leave. The wonder of wonders. He stayed. In spite of me. And so, he says, because of this, because God acted and initiated and put his spirit in us and stayed with us. We weren't worthy when he started and we're still not worthy. Because we see this and we experience this, we keep coming to know Amen. and coming to rely on the love he has for us. Hallelujah. It's a continual experience that washes over us over time and it causes the conviction to deepen and deepen yes. until we say, wow. Amen. Yes. yes. He loves me. That's how he perfects us in his love. Yes. As we experience him just the way we are over time. Mm. Woo! Praise his holy name. Praise his name. Hallelujah. So hold on. You're not sure that God loves you? Hold on. He's about to show you. He's showing you right now. He'll keep on showing until it sinks in yeah. and you come to that ah moment. Man. Loves me. Yeah. That's why Paul says, for I hmm. am persuaded. Yes. <laughs> you get it? Yeah. I'm persuaded that that word is always in the tense that means past action with continuing result. I'm persuaded it took time, it took experience, it took some convincing. At first I didn't know, but now because all I've been through, because all I've seen, I'm persuaded yes. that there's nothing that can separate us Hallelujah. from the love yes. of God. Yes. I'm persuaded yes. that neither angels, nor principalities, yes. no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no death, no any other creature shall be able to separate us Hallelujah. from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. He became persuaded, and I'm becoming persuaded. God is working through his indwelling spirit by his unconditional love to persuade you. And the more you recognize the love, Hallelujah. the unconditional love, is the more fear gets kicked out. Yes. And when love replaces 
is the center where fear was, hmm. then our lives start to change. Yes. Yes. We start treating people with love. Yes. We start being gracious when we used to be belligerent. We start being patient when we used to be so impatient. We learn how to shut our mouth when we used to run it off so much. We learn how to forgive when we used to be so unforgiving. The love changes us. What about our compulsions and addictions? Well, <laughs> they start to fade away because I realize I don't need them. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. He perfects us in his love with perfect love. And John goes on to say, John goes on to say that this experience leads to another experience. He says, because of this, now we have boldness. Well. <laughs> Come on. Boldness. Yeah. This is not boldness to, you know, just be whoever you want to be and tell them whatever you want to tell them. No, not that type of boldness. Boldness before God. Yeah. Where we used to be afraid and cowering and hiding, dreading judgment, believing that, oh, he's going to get rid of me. He doesn't want me. He doesn't love me anymore. No, now we have boldness. Boldness to come to the throne. Boldness to be wrapped in the Father's embrace. Boldness to sit on his lap and just know this is my daddy and he loves me. There's no more fearful expectation of judgment because everything between me and God is okay now. I've got boldness. No more guilt. No more fear. Blessed assurance. His boldness comes because as he is, so we are in the world. Do you hear that? We gain confidence because we see that this perfect love is actually transforming us. Perfect love transforms us into perfect love. Oh, that's a powerful word. I'm talking about the word of God. That's a powerful word. It means a fear. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And the world does not know us because it didn't know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he comes, we shall be like him. For we shall see him. As he 